the initial kind of contact with with Perva was through Russell in the beginning, and um, I then went over and, and made contact with Jumling Tenzing, um, who I had met rock climbing and doing some adventure race in New Zealand, actually. Um, so I'd known him for quite a while and had stayed in contact. Again, I think I'd always had this thing that there's a, there's a Sherpa story somewhere and I just hadn't worked out what it was yet. And so, so then what happened is, um, I think once we got financed, um, I then went over, we just went and hung out in the village. They were just coming back from climbing some other mountain in the off season um, with a bunch of clients and and I kind of arrived as the clients were taking off in a helicopter out of a potato field and, and then we just went into Perba's Lodge and had a cup of tea and talked about it. And I just said, you know, Russell, I know Russell wants to do the film, but do you, do you really want to do the film? And do you know what it means? Because I know you don't like being on camera very much. And, you know, um, you know, we just had the discussion. And this is what it will, before you answer that question, here's what it's going to mean, you know. We're going to be doing this, we're going to be doing that, we're going to be in your face quite a lot, we're going to need to be, you know, on the rope fixing team. And then and he said, yeah, yeah, no, I think it's important, I think it's the right time, and he was up for it. And then we talked about then how we wanted to involve uh, the community. I'd always wanted to have um, some Sherpa cameramen, and then, so then on a set, we chose them on that trip, um, or he recommended two young guys who we then met, um, and they were just... I'd, I had w met one of them before, years earlier. Um, so young and just so fantastic. D one of them in particular is the best film student I've ever had he, in the camera sort of world. He was just so focused. Um, and I didn't really have very high expectations. So the, we went over there then on a separate trip. I went up with our post-production guy who went to kind of manage all of the logistics and stuff and Hugh Miller, the Australian, and we went, the Sherpas were doing some training at, there's this um, school that's been set up called the Kumbu Climbing School where they get skills. And we had this young Shapani character that we wanted to f follow in the film and she was gonna go and do this climbing training, whatever. And so we used that as an opportunity to train the Sherpas in shooting something. Um, it didn't end up in the film, um, but it was, uh, oh, some of it maybe. Um, but that's where we did the, the training and taught them how to use the cameras and how to get their finger off the zoom. I'm like, don't touch the zoom ever. <laughs> just walk in with your feet because that's the, the worst thing with amateurs is, is just whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> and they were great. And so then, and then I talked to them about, I knew that we weren't gonna get, they start the base camp set up weeks before we even arrive in Kathmandu. So, I didn't have very high expectations that they would shoot stuff well, but I told them what to do. Just put it on a tripod, for example, if you're doing the white pod and just leave it, just film it and just let it roll because I knew then we could speed stuff up or different things. And, and the stuff they came back with was, as you saw in the film, they did all of that and it was really usable. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, I was so, so blown away. And in fact, Narwang, um, just got employed by Discovery Channel to shoot Russell's expedition. Um, the guy that talks about leaving a legacy for his family, he just, and Narwang filmed him all the way to the summit and, you know, messaged me and told me that he got the job and, you know, because I've said if you ever need any recommendations and... Probably all, like, the first trip was probably three months out, then another one two months out. Um, and then I went ahead before the expedition and spent a bit more time. And then I went over to Darjeeling to shoot the stuff with Tenzing Norgay's daughter, Pem Pem, um, all before. So I did three separate trips before the, the main shoot. And all of that stuff was really worth it. Yes. Um, just to get yourself back into the groove of being in that part of the world as well, but just developing the relationships. And I spent a lot of time with Perba, so we hung out quite a bit in Kathmandu and we went and filmed those beautiful scenes with the boys doing their mantras and those beautiful, that's his son who lives in a monastery in Kathmandu and so that was something that may have been part of the story thread but in the end wasn't because of the drama that happened and so it was good actually for us to just connect again and spend time together and I spent time with his parents and who I love, they both since died. Yeah, his mother died two days before the earthquake and his father died six months later so... 
It was very sad. No, not on the first trip. Just stills and recce stuff. Um, the second trip with Hugh, we did shoot um, uh, some backstory stuff and some character stuff with Yangji, particularly the the Shapani girl that um, didn't end up in the film. But she's you can see there's a whole behind the scenes little featurette of this character that didn't end up in the film, which was really sad. I badly wanted her to be in the film, but in the end I had to agree. Everyone else is telling me. It's like, she's amazing and it's a great story, but I don't really get how she fits into the bigger story, and they were right. I, what we had to deliver as part of the deliverables, or the, the actually for the finance, the, when we went in for production funding. Yeah, so we delivered this at the end of development, but then we submitted it um, with the 20 page treatment and all the other bits and pieces, the budget and the schedule and all of that. Um, so it is essentially, it's, it's, it was three acts and it was that this is how the film begins and then, and then this happens and this happens and, and it just sort of states essentially, uh, you know, what the film would look like. Um, I remember the ending was the hardest thing to write because, you know, um, it was hard to know how things would play out. I can't remember what I wrote, actually. Yeah, but in a weird kind of way, it was the same ending. It was that they come home, the, the foreigners all take off and they're at the Hyatt within two hours and um, the Sherpas are left packing up camp and then ten days later they go home and life goes on and they get back to farming the potatoes and, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the foreigners are heroically doing their public speaking tours and whatever and the Sherpas just get on with it. And I think the ending was a little bit in that vein. It was kind of like, big deal you know, next <laughs> kind of thing. And Perba would have climbed the mountain twice because he climbs it as the uh, head of the rope fixing team. So they fix the ropes all the way to the summit, then he comes back down and rests and then he goes all the way back up again. So he, that's why he's had done so many ascents is that he generally climbs the mountain twice a year or twice in a season. Yes, yeah, thank God. He's working for Russell as his base camp manager, but he won't go on the mountain anymore. So that was, um, that was, I was nervous that actually he would change his mind. Um, but they went and did this big K2 expedition, which failed, but he, and he'd always wanted to climb K2. And he didn't, he didn't go at all on that trip. And then the next year he didn't go at all. Um, and then this most recent year, he just went as the base camp manager. And the reason that I kind of knew that that was going to be the case was that when we were back in Perba's house after the expedition, you know, we had our laptops and our data wrangling gear everywhere, which is what he was watching those shots of the ice fall on with the kids. A lot of people think he's really rich and that they're his laptops. <laughs> Not the case at all. Um, and he was, we had done this interview with the Tengbushe Lama um, Rinpoche. Tengbushe is that beautiful monastery that you see up on the hill. And, um, and he's a very famous um, Rinpoche and we'd done an interview with him in Kathmandu at the very beginning. Um, and he's absolutely anti-climbing. Perba's brother is a monk at that monastery. Um, and so he follows that Lama. And so then we were, our translator was there on the laptop translating it for us. Um, and, and Perba kind of pushed him out of the way and sat down and just put the headphones on and watched the whole two hour interview and, and it was after that that we did the interview with him and he said, I'm quitting climbing. And it was that, yeah, I think he was kind of shocked into, um, and he said, you know, I've realised that it's not about me and my ability to climb, but something like that might happen and then my body won't be able to reincarnate. And it was about the spiritual fear um, rather than the fear of death itself. And I really only relaxed, it was, it was the last interview of the last day of the shoot really, where I did that interview with Perver and he said, I'm going to quit climbing. And uh, until that moment, I didn't know that we had a film. And I thought, when he said that, I thought, maybe just, maybe we have a story here because we have real character development as a result. If he hadn't responded to that, you know, the disaster in that way, um, it would have been harder to have an emotional arc for him. And so I think that's that his decision to do that was kind of what really, for me, is the most important part. And in fact, his wife is probably for me the most important character in the film because she sets up that 
conflict. And that was just an absolute bolt out of the blue. I mean, I had met her a number of times and she was incredibly shy, and I, but I really like her. And then we just switched the camera on and it was just Hugh and Ken and Renan, sorry, uh, sorry, Renan and Ken. And Renan had spent, because he could speak with her and we all just sort of wandered into the kitchen and said, oh, we just want to ask you a few questions. And, and then just boom, and I turned around at the end of the interview because it was actually shot at the end of the film before she knew that he'd quit climbing. So she was really angry with him. And, um, and I turned around at the end of the interview <coughs> and Ken and Renan were both crying and the translator was crying and she and I were crying and we just sort of, um, my favourite photo actually is this photo of she and I having this big hug um, and but that was what gave the film I think its emotional soul because it made it so deeply personal. It's actually when I saw the film for the first time, that, that, like that's the film for me. Yeah, that is the film. So, st so that's why the avalanche, yes, it's a, it turned it into political drama, or whatever, but the heart and soul of the film is in that, mm. that kitchen and that family. Yeah. And I mean, if I could change anything in the film, it's like all of that setup that you've got to do, like the first act where you've got to go, this has happened, and Tenzing will go that, and blah, 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 blah. And we just tried and tried and tried to pull as much of that out as we could, but in all of the test screenings, people are like, but we need to know this and why that and why this and, you know, but that, they're the moments that it breaks that cinematic spell for me. But, you know, I don't know, in the end, I, I, I kind of figured, well, if the audience feels it needs to know that stuff, well, we'll just try and make those other moments count. But, um, yeah, no, she, she is incredibly... I mean, I, you know, you talk about working with actors and... and I mean, the, the documentary drama, whole thing. I mean, I've never seen a face tell more of a story in its complete silence. And just when she's trying to stop herself crying and her face is like wrinkling up. And then when, when Perba leaves and the, the, one of the twins, his face does exactly the same thing as hers. He's just kind of wrestling his eyebrows to stop himself crying. As, and they're just very humanly real moments. Mm -hmm.